a marshmallow, squishy, chewy, delicious, and it is a test of whether or not you love Jesus. <laughs> so who needs a marshmallow who doesn't have one? Just if you don't have a marshmallow, you need a marshmallow. Does everyone have a marshmallow? You need to have a marshmallow. We have some people distributing marshmallows, even as we speak, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, <laughs> indicate that you need a marshmallow. But the one thing I do not want you to do this morning is to enjoy this marshmallow. Not until I tell you. You see, for the last two months, we have been looking at just two verses from the Bible. In fact, we haven't just been looking at two verses. We've been focusing in on nine words. Literally, we have been going through the Bible word by word. The verses we have been looking at come to us from the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in central Turkey in the region of Galatia. It is preserved for us in our Bibles as what we call the book of Galatians. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, there is a list of nine words. It says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so we have been looking at these nine words in Galatians 5, 22, and 23, but we really have not. We've only been looking at one word. I suggested almost two months ago that Galatians 5.22 is not a list of the fruits of the Spirit, but of the singular fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. Grammatically, the structure of this sentence in Galatians 5.22 and 23 places the, uh, the word love, agape, as an apotesis, grammatically, the words that follow love modify love. You could say that love looks like joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is how we know what love is. It looks like these things. So we have been, for the last two months, basically, talking about one word, love. Now, you may say, Dave, man, that's, that's a lot of time spent talking about one word, but can you think of anything in our day that is more important for us to be excellent at than to be people who truly know what love is, who know what it is and know how to show love? It, it's obviously that important. In fact, it was the Apostle Paul in his famous chapter about love in the letter to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he begins by saying, if I were to be able to speak in the tongues of men and angels, in unknown languages, but I didn't have love, I would just be making noise. I would be a, a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. He said, if I, could, if I could know all things and I could fathom all ministries, if I had faith that could move mountains, 
but I didn't have love, I would amount to nothing. He says, if I give my body, I give everything that I have to the poor, and I give my body literally as a sacrifice, I give my body to the flames, I give away everything that I have, but if I do not have love, I gain nothing. It's worthless. It's a waste of time. So I think these have been two months well spent focusing on the fruit of the Spirit that is love. So I think it's worth us remembering that. I think it's worth us saying it together. So would you say Galatians 5, 22 and 23 with me? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are things that are worth remembering. And today, we come to the last of the eight modifiers of love. Love looks a lot like today the marshmallow because it looks a lot like self-control. But before we talk about what that means and how we do it, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, and that you would use your word spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to challenge us and to move us and to change us May we not just be people who know about love. May we be people who go about showing love. Pray that for myself and for my family and for all of us here. For I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. His name was Walter Meischel. Walter Meischel in... uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s was one of the leading academic researchers in the psychological field of the study of self-control. Walter Meischel taught at Harvard University and at Stanford University and at Columbia University and made quite a reputation developing clinical and therapeutic techniques for behavioral therapy, which eventually became cognitive behavioral therapy that is used by clinicians to this day. But Walter Meischel is most famous for an experiment that he conducted in the late 1960s. He and his team conducted an experiment which has come to be known as the Marshmallow Experiment. And what the Marshmallow Experiment is, is they took a group of a couple of hundred preschoolers and five and six-year-olds, and they put them in a room with a prompter and a single marshmallow. And the prompter said to the child, this marshmallow, if you do not eat it for 10 minutes, I will give you a second marshmallow, if you don't eat it for 10 minutes. And then they measured the impulsivity of these children, and they were looking for differences of gender, differences of race, differences of socioeconomic background. They were looking for patterns, the predictability of the absence or the presence of self-control in these young children. Eventually, in the test, they added a variable in the test that they called hot and cold temptations. The cold temptation meant that a couple minutes into the 10 minutes, the prompter would begin to describe the marshmallow to the child would say, look at this, look at this marshmallow, it, feel it, it's, it's texture, it's squishy, it's, it's white, and examine the color. These were the cold temptations, the hot temptations. The prompter would sit in the room and say, marshmallows are delicious. <laughs> we love them. Do you remember when you were at a campfire with your families and you roasted them and how gooey and sweet they were, how lovely they were, how they felt squishy in your mouth and on your tongue. And what they obviously found was that the children who were exposed to cold temptations were far less likely to behave impulsively than the children who were exposed to hot temptations. But of all of the results of of Meissner's marshmallow test, Meissner and his team found out something dramatic many years later. A few decades later, they went back and they interviewed 
these same children, now as young adults, and they interviewed their parents. And what they found was that there was a stunning correlation between the children who, as preschoolers, had behaved impulsively in cases of obesity and increased body mass index. What was shocking to them was they also found that there was a higher degree of children who were successful in business, who had higher test standardized test scores and GPAs related to those who had resisted the temptation to eat the marshmallow. It showed that over time, self-control was shaping the destiny of these children's lives. So what is it? What is self-control? What does it mean? Well, psychologically speaking, self-control is really self-denial. It is self-inhibition, self-regulation. It is, is a form of self-discipline. In fact, in the psychological literature, this is how self-control is described. Self-control is an aspect of inhibitory control. It is the ability to regulate one's emotions, thoughts, and behavior in the face of temptation and impulses. As an executive function, it is a cognitive process that is necessary for regulating one's behavior in order to achieve specific goals. Self-control is thought to be much like a muscle. Whether emotional or behavioral, self-control is a limited resource which functions like energy. In the short term, overuse of self-control leads to depletion. However, in the long term, the use of self-control can strengthen and improve over time. Now, if you compare the psychological definition of self-control as, as self-regulation, as self-inhibition, as, as self-discipline, you find an overlap with the attributes of self-control in the Bible. The Bible very much represents self-control as this self-regulatory, self-inhibitory, self-discipline that, that improves the quality of our lives. And in that respect, the biblical definition of self-control and the psychological definition of self-control are, are, are pretty much identical, except for one thing. The word in the New Testament that is used for self-control most often is the word egratia. Egratia literally means, and it's not used that often in the New Testament, but it, it, it literally means in strength or in power. If you break the word down, it has a prefix. The epsilon gamma egg is the prefix, and that means in. When you put that prefix on a word, it means in something or by means of something. And the word, the root word, is the word kratia, which comes from the word kratos. And kratos is an unusual word. You see, the most common word in the Greek language for power or for strength is the word dunamis, from which we get dynamite. But this word is a very different word. It means a very specific kind of power or strength. It means exclusively a strength that comes from God. It's used by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1, he talks about the strength, the mighty kratos, God's power that raised Christ from the dead. He uses kratos again in Ephesians chapter 6, where he talks about God's mighty strength, God's mighty kratos. It is an attribute exclusively ascribed to God. God is the source of the power. Peter uses this the same way. In 1 Peter chapter 4, he talks about, in a doxological way, he talks about God's glory and God's mighty kratos, God's mighty power. He repeats the phrase again in 1 Peter chapter 6, where he talks about God's mighty kratos power. You see the difference between the self-control in a purely psychological definition and self-control in a biblical definition is self-control relies on God's strength, not ours. It's hard for us to understand, but it's like a light bulb. 
Have you ever held a light bulb in your hand and had it go on, turn on, just by holding it? No, we know that a light bulb, it, just, it doesn't function with, until it is connected to a power source. And then it illuminates, and then, and then the, 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 the filament in the vacuum glows, and, and we see the light, but it, it's nothing without the power source. You see, self-control in the Bible is a self-willed control by God. It's hard for me to believe, but it was 36 years ago, over, over 36 years ago. And, and the reason I remember that is, is Diane was pregnant with our youngest daughter, Caitlin, and she's 36 years old. And for some reason, that, to this day, I don't know exactly why we decided to do this. Because we had a, we had a, a, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and my wife was six months pregnant with another child. We decided, brilliantly, to take a road trip in our little Volvo station wagon to Yellowstone National Park. Do you realize how far away Yellowstone is? It is forever away when you have two preschoolers and a pregnant wife. But the reason, one of the reasons we decided to do this was we had friends in Dallas whose family had a gigantic multiple 100,000 acre cattle ranch in southwestern Nebraska. And they said, why don't you come up here and be cowboys for a while with our family? And I thought, that will be great. And so we went up to this little town called Imperial, Nebraska, in southwest Nebraska, and we stayed with Cal and Barb Gurman on their multiple 100,000-acre cattle ranch. And Cal Gurman was a man's man. He was not a man to be trifled with. Cal Gurman was the kind of guy who, when you met him, he would intentionally squeeze your hand so hard, shaking your hand, that he wanted you to beg him to let him go. And if you cried, I don't think he became friends with you. And so Cal would say, that's how I know if a, if a man's a man's man. And fortunately, I didn't know that, but we had this kind of hand-squeezing contest until he said, okay, we're fine. But, but Cal... Cal, you know, was a rancher, and, and Cal was also an Air Force pilot, and he had flown in the Korean War. In fact, he had been shot down behind enemy lines and survived. So this was the kind of guy you didn't mess with. And Cal had a number of airplanes, because he had a, a, a ranch that covered, that covered many square miles. He had airplanes to fly to cattle auctions, to fly to check on his cattle. He also had a special plane that he flew to Nebraska football games. And he said, Dave, do you want to go fly with me? And I was like, absolutely. This is going to be fun. So we drive to this little, this little jicky airport in Imperial, Nebraska. It's just a couple rows of hangars. And they have his airplanes in them. And he opens up the one and he shows me this beautiful Beechcraft twin. It, was, it had curtains in the windows and tinted glass. It was really nice. I thought, this is going to be great. But he said, we're not going to fly in that. If we go to the hangar next door and we open the doors and I'm looking at what looks like a paper mache airplane. It was this yellow thing. And he goes, here, help me pull it out. And we grabbed the wing struts and pulled it out. And I promise you, I've pushed lawnmowers that weighed more than this airplane. It was an airplane called a Citabra. And so it, it, it was two seats, one in front of the other. And, and it didn't have a door. It kind of had a flap on the side. And so we get in the plane. And, and all he says to me is, make sure your belts are on tight. It had shoulder harnesses, lap belts. And then he's tapping on a, on a little plexiglass window above our heads to make sure there's gasoline in the plane, fuel, because that's how you check the fuel, the little window. I'm like, the fuel is above our heads? And I didn't say that. And he goes, you ready? And he started up, and we took off. I promise you, for the next hour, I was upside down more than I was right side up. We were flying through the sky of Nebraska, doing barrel rolls, doing, doing, doing stalls, doing loops, doing all kinds of things. It's literally the only time in my life when I actually could not tell which way was up. Because I was looking over Cal's shoulder out the window, and all I saw was ground sky, ground sky, ground sky. And so we flew, and, and, and we survived, obviously. <laughs> But the most interesting thing about the Citabra, and, and you have to know that Citabra is somebody's idea of a joke, 
because Satabra is the word aerobatic spelled backwards. That should have been my first clue. But, it, but the plane only sat two people. There were two seats. There was a pilot seat in front and the seat I was in in the back. And the interesting thing about the Satabra was that there was a full set of flight controls in the back seat. There was, there was a stick and a rudder and there were, there were the rudder pedals and there was a throttle control, a fuel mixture control, and I, I could have flown the plane from the back seat. Now, whether or not I could have wrestled it away from Cal was very unlikely, but the reality is I had the ability to choose to fly the plane. The problem is there were only two people in the plane and only one of them was a pilot, and that wasn't me. You want to know what self-control looks like? Suffering code control looks just like trusting the pilot. You see, the amazing thing about self-control is that, is that it is our decision, our choice. God has created a universe in which we are free to decide whether or not we will trust him. And we can fight the stick and we can fight the pilot our whole life. Or we can believe that the pilot knows what the pilot's doing. This is no easy thing. It's, this is hard. It's hard to do. And, and, and I, it's hard because it's an oxymoron. It's a paradox. Self-control is giving up control. Self-control is releasing control to God. Self-control is not me controlling myself, but allowing God to control me. God controls myself. And that's, that's, that's a hard thing to do. Now, this was hard not just for all of us. It's, it was hard for the Apostle Paul. It was hard for the, for, the, for, for the architect of the New Testament. In Romans chapter 7, he says, I don't even understand what I do because the thing that I want to do is what I, what I hate to do or I wind up doing what I hate to do. And the, the, the very thing, the evil thing, I don't want to do, that's the thing that I keep on doing. You see, the struggle, to, the struggle to release control, I blame Darwin, actually. Because, and it's not Darwin's fault, but Darwin made the case that we are just highly developed animals. The only difference between us and the lions and the tigers and the bears is that, that we have a consciousness, we have a, a, more, a more fully developed sense of self. But we have in us, in our, in our human nature, an instinct of self-preservation. And that instinct of self-preservation compels us to control everything, to control our environment, to control, control the dangers of the world. And so we obsess over, over the accumulation of the things that build safety, that build security, that build comfort. And, and, and we, we're seduced into this idea that moderation is for suckers. That if you really want to succeed in life, you always need more. And what you need more of is more control. So how do we do it? How do, we, how do we, if we are inclined to, to, to disregard God and to seek to control our world and ourselves on our own, how, how do we make it happen? Well, from a psychological point of view, the, the solution that has been suggested is what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's rooted in some of the greatest academic and researchers of the 20th century, like Ivan Pavlov and, and B.F. Skinner and, and Abraham Maslow and, and Walter Meischel. But it was B.F. Skinner who pioneered what has fallen on disfavor in clinical circles now. But B.F. Skinner pioneered the idea of, of behavioral therapy of changing how we exhibit self-control by, by learning different behaviors, alternate behaviors. And over Skinner's career, he, he collected or he listed nine techniques that he used in his behavioral therapy clinic. They are 
Physical restraint and assistance is the most extreme case to keep a person from harming themselves or from, 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 from doing something to others. A physical restraint. Stimulus rem removal is the second one. Third one was deprivation and satiation, teaching the people to become satisfied by depriving them with, of their normal food or their sleep or their fears. Fourth was manipulation of emotional conditions. Fifth was aversive stimulation, which is, which is punishing a person. When something goes wrong, you, you make it painful for them. Sixth thing was drugs, to use psychotropic drugs. Number seven is operant conditioning, which is, is positive reinforcement, saying that was good, that was better. Then number eight was self-punishment, encouraging the person to hold themselves more accountable. But it's number nine that's most interesting. It sounds like he kind of mailed it in on number nine. He just ran out of, I just do something else. But Skinner made an important observation about that ninth category. He said that what he had found was that was the primary way that people of faith changed their behavior and improved their self-control. The people with a deeply religious conviction were people who went about changing their ability to be more self-controlled by introducing into their lives alternatives. It's what I call spiritual replacement theory. Now I know that all of us know some people whose, whose life trauma and whose, whose struggle with paranoia or anxiety or, or fear or addiction is so, so desperate because of the wounds and because of the struggles of their life journey that they need, they need, they need focused clinical or professional help to work through, to sort through those, those inner issues to guide them through the inner work. But for most of us, how do we just keep from eating too much? How do we keep from giving into those temptations, those renegade rogue thoughts that seem to, seem to pop up everywhere in our lives? Well, I would suggest that one of the ways we do it is behavioral therapy, spiritual replacement therapy. You begin to fill your life with the things that are life-giving, that are encouraging, that are affirming. You begin manifesting those things to others. And the principle is simple. If you fill your life with so much good, there's less room for the bad. If you fill your life with more light, there's less room for the dark. Walter Meischel did a study, the marshmallow experiment, and, and found a number of interesting things. He found out that, that socioeconomic factors did lead children, children who grew up in poverty, were more inclined to be impulsive and to, to eat the marshmallow. They found that there was very little difference, uh, just a statistical difference between boys and girls. That's kind of shocking. I thought boys would be much more impossible, but it wasn't. There was no difference between races. But they found that the number one difference that, that children developed an impulsivity, an environment that created a lack of self-control was one thing. There was one dominant feature of their lives. And this is convicting stuff. You know what it was? Absentee parents. Because they found that the children who had broken or absent relationships with their parents were less inclined to trust adults and those in authority. And they found it more difficult to trust the prompter when the prompter said, if you wait 10 minutes, I will give you a second marshmallow. And what, and what Michael came to the conclusion was that at the core of self-control is one key issue, the issue of Trust. As I was tumbling through the sky over Nebraska with Cal German, and he was laughing hilariously, trying to make me throw up because, because Cal had this thing. He said, that's how I get the inside of my airplane clean. If, because if you throw up in my airplane, you have to clean it. And I disappointed him in that I didn't throw up in his airplane, but there were two things that occurred to me as we were tumbling through the sky over southwestern Nebraska. The first one was, there's only two people in this airplane, and only one of them is a pilot, and that's not me. 
But the second thing that occurred to me was just as important. And that was the idea, the cow didn't want to die either. <laughs> the cow wasn't saying, hey Dave, let's go up in the plane and end everything. Cow wanted to get me home as much as he wanted to be home. Why is it that we imagine that God somehow has any less of a passion for us? I don't know what kind of God you have faith in, but the kind of God that I have faith in makes no mistakes, is perfect in knowledge and perfect in power and perfect in love. And it is the promise that I will get you home. Even when your world is spinning, even when you seem to be literally falling out of the sky, I have brought you with me to bring you home. And you can trust the pilot. You see, this is what's embedded in the idea of a kratia. It's embedded in this root word, in power. It's not in our power. It's in the acquiescence of our power to God's power. Because it's in his power that our lives are controlled. He is the one who is in control. And our choice is to trust that. So there's one last question, one final question that we have to ask. And this is a question that was asked by, by a, a brilliant social commentator, a person who, is a, who was what I call an expert dance theologian. Her name was Tina Turner. And she asked this question in 1984 on her best-selling album ever called Private Dancer. And it was a song that as soon as I mention it, it will be stuck in your head like a tumor. But it was her best-selling song. It is a song called What's Love Got to Do With It? What does love have to do with it? What does love have to do with self-control? What does love have to do with trust? Everything. It has everything to do with it. That's why when we are considering what, what is the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of God in us creates in us love. And that love is represented to us through joy and peace and patience and, and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. This is where self-control comes from, from trusting in a loving God. That's why I think it's worth remembering the, the, the way that we have studied this passage we have spent two months talking about love. We spent two months in the orchard, as it were, looking at this fruit. And so I think it's worth remembering what that fruit is. Would you say Galatians 5, 22 and 23 with me? For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the marshmallow. Enjoy. <laughs>